Thank you for inviting me to judge your golden anniversary poetry competition on the theme of 50. It's an honour and I'm very much looking forward to reading the entries. I'm sorry I can't be with you on the evening you launch the competition, so Terry and Mike have kindly suggested I waffle on here a bit about what I'll probably be looking for in a strong competition entry. As you know, much of poetry is subjective and what appeals to one person may not appeal to another. However, it's important to recognise that there are no rights and wrongs in poetry or in our responses to them. Poetry is a matter of taste and experience. Having said this though, what I try to achieve in my own work and what I value in other people's poems is an attention to the craft of writing a poem. What I mean by craft is the attention to line breaks, spelling, grammar, how the poem travels down the page, the logic of its argument or journey, that is. It's also obvious when a poem comes from the heart, and so I think that being honest is a good place to start. Doing these things, I believe, shows that the poet knows both what they want to say and how they want to say it. I think poetry is a gift. It's a way of saying, look, here is my take on this particular issue or thought or feeling. I'd like to welcome you in and for you to read yourself into it, taste it and savour it, find beauty or meaning in it. And so I like poems that are generous in this way, poems that don't exclude the reader. However, I also value poems whose meanings are layered, where what's said between the lines is as important as what's said in the lines. I also favour poems that pay attention to the beauty of language, those that use unusual words in unusual or surprising ways. Our language is infinitely malleable, so play around with it, take risks, make it musical and rhythmic. Additionally, I like to learn something from a poem, come out of it wanting to read it again and knowing or appreciating something I didn't know or appreciate before. So the way a poem looks on the page is also important to me. So my advice would be to make the white space work for you as much as the words. I'm not a huge fan of end rhymes, but love internal rhymes and admire anyone who can write successfully in form. One thing I've also noticed about poems that are deemed successful is like in scenes in fiction, they start late and end early. What I mean by this is, I believe it's beholden on us to scrutinise our poem's first lines and ask ourselves whether they're there to write ourselves into the poem or whether the poem can do without them. I've discovered that when I write my first line, it can often sometimes actually appear about halfway down the poem. And with regard to how to end a poem, I believe we don't need to, nor should we, tie our poems up in a big bow and have them say, ta-da, this is what this poem means. Leave it to the poem and the reader to derive meaning. Finally, if you leave your reader slightly puzzled and wanting more to know more, they're more likely to reread the poem, and as we know, good poems improve on further reading. So I hope what I've said will be helpful to you. For me, a poem should be well-crafted, have its own internal energy, and should tumble down the page. It should say something significant, be original, honest, and generous. Before I go, though, Mike and Terry have suggested I talk a little about how I write and where I get my inspiration from. It's a tricky brief to fill, as both these things vary very greatly. Poems come because I see my life's experiences in them. Something will happen or a thought or will occur to me. And the way I make sense of it is by crafting a poem around it as a way to hold or contain the happening or the thought and as a way of sharing this happening or thought with the wider world. To do this, I'm going to talk a bit about a poem I wrote about the process of writing a poem. I've chosen this one because it won the Charles Causley Prize in 2015 and so someone else has thought it has merit. Uh, the poem started with a workshop on bridges, hence the epigraph, and ended as an exploration about the trust we need to have A to embark on a poem and B to reach the other side of it. I wanted to write it both as a physical description of process, hence the horse, 
and also a metaphorical description of the journey to a poem. I was also keen to make it rhythmic, visual, tactile and somewhat unusual. I believe I start the poem efficiently, efficiently and leave it without too much of a ta-da, but I'll read it to you and so you can hopefully see for yourself what I mean. Before I do read it, I just want to say thank you again for the honour of judging your competition. Good luck, and I look forward to reading the poems and to the results night very much. Trust and the Horse Always it is by bridges that we live. Philip Larkin One day I will ride to the poem on horseback. The poem will be far away, built from the spaces between lines and wires, from words made with the voices of birds. My horse will sway, his coat dusty with heat and the company of flies. His head will nod with a wisdom and rhythm that's hypnotic, powerful, blind. The bridge we'll cross will be of hope and oak. Echoes and orphans will live in the shadows beneath and below us will be water and sometimes sand and below us will sometimes be sky what i fear is trust but my horse will step surely in the daylight and the night light my horse will step to the pop of fish breath and the shudder of shorelines my horse will step through blue air my horse and i will step together will measure our footfalls in millions and in small numbers.